Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies, Mr. Heng Sui Kiat. NUS Chairman, Mr. Xie Fu Hua. NUS President, Professor Tan Eng Chai. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to the NUS 115 Distinguished Speaker Series, Shaping the Future of Singapore. I am Natalie, a Year 3 student from the NUS School of Computing. The NUS 115 Distinguished Speaker Series, organized to mark the university's 115th year of founding, brings together compelling speakers to share their unique perspectives on pressing issues of the future that affect our country, our region, and the world. The series explores the overarching theme of shaping the future and encourages thought-provoking ideas and conversations that inspire debate and discussion. We have a very special session here today in our final edition of the series. Mr. Heng Sui Kiat, Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for the Economic Policies, will be sharing with us his insights on the future of Singapore. Moderating the Q&A session with DPN Heng is Associate Professor Suzaina Kadir, who is Vice Dean Academic Affairs at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It is now my pleasure to invite NUS President Professor Tan Eng Chai to begin by saying a few words. Prof Tan, please. Deputy Prime Minister and Coordinating Minister for Economic Policies, Mr. Heng Sui Kiet, NUS Chairman, Mr. Xie Fu Hua, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Welcome to the NUS 115 Distinguished Speaker Series event. I would especially like to thank DPM Heng for taking time to grace this occasion as our speaker. We are very honoured to have DPM close the series with a talk on the future of Singapore. The future has been the leitmotif of this speaker series. What does the future hold? How can we best prepare for it when disruptions from relentless digitization to geopolitical shifts seem to occur a mile a minute. In this series, we have explored what the future might look like for education and work and their attendant challenges. It is perhaps fitting then that today we are rounding up the series by considering the future of Singapore in aggregate. Singapore is weathering one of its greatest challenges today. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, will not be the last of our problems and challenges. It is sobering to reflect on COVID-19 and its impact. Across the world, we have seen how healthcare systems have been overwhelmed to the extreme and how entire societies have been polarised over something as seemingly innocuous as the mask. Economies are struggling, even as industries are trying to reform, digitize, and find their footing amidst great technological change. The resilience of supply chain and infrastructure have come under great testing. Apart from COVID-19 and our planet, is under siege by climate change. Globally, 2020 was one of the hottest year on record, part of a worrying trend that fuels the loss of diversity, biodiversity, more severe weather systems, and the increasing displacement of those who are already vulnerable. As we contemplate these developments and how they could affect the future of Singapore. I would like to recall DPM Heng's words from a former speech. And I quote, Our future Singapore, the Singapore we are building together, must be an expanded democracy of deeds with citizens taking action to make a difference. Indeed, 
There's much we have to tackle together, and we will need to continue to build new strengths and stay united. In a plural and diverse society like Singapore, each brings their own perspectives, experiences and skills to bear. We must come together to co-create solutions. Universities certainly have an important role to play. At NUS, we have always believed in the value of working collectively with communities, businesses, and other education and research institutions to innovate and break new grounds, developing insights and solutions that can shape Singapore's future. Food security is one example. Our researchers are constantly looking into ways to make future food demands from increasing the resilience of locally farmed crops to keeping fishes healthy and free from virus, startups supported by NUS have successfully pioneered urban farming systems and created zero-waste food products. And we are looking to see even more of these agri-tech innovations by bringing together scientists, entrepreneurs and industry to test bed real-world solutions. Our students play an important role too. Whether it is in raising awareness of local produce on campus or creating apps to reduce food waste. Each initiative and every single effort across the university adds up and brings us one step closer to Singapore's 30 by 30 goal. In much the same way, our work in the areas of artificial intelligence and smart nation, urban solutions and sustainability, and human health and wellness, amongst others, is done not just in silo, but with an eye to the wider community and society. Besides advancing research and innovation as Singapore's flagship public university, and U.S. plays an instrumental role in preparing and nurturing talent for Singapore's future. Our focus goes beyond imparting skills and book knowledge to our students. We also seek to help them contextualize their learning in a complex and fast-changing world. As several other occasions, I had described deep reforms to the NUS education system and how a strong common curriculum, flexible pathways, and interdisciplinary education will build intellectual versatility, connections, and capacity for our graduates to thrive in the changing world and engage in lifelong learning. Today, I would like to share another important enhancement NUS has made to our educational experience. For this academic year, NUS is introducing a new pillar to our general education curriculum called Communities and Engagement. Our students will learn about project management and design thinking by putting them into practice through actual community projects. These projects address a range of issues from climate change to caring for an aging population to promoting mental health and wellness. Here, our students are given a taste of what it means to shape the future for different groups of Singaporeans, an experience which they can hopefully 
scale up as they move through and beyond university. Since we are talking about the future today, a story from the not-too-distant past might be instructive. Uh, in 2011, the Nat National Intelligence Office in the US started a four-year prediction tournament. All right, prediction tournament as part of research on the science of forecasting. The premise was simple. Teams were to compete in giving predictions to all kinds of questions, uh, such as whether a certain year would be the Earth's warmest year on record, or whether a certain party would win an election, and so on and so forth. The teams were led by researchers, but otherwise they could recruit, train, and experiment however they wish. At the end of the four years, there was actually one team that pulled way ahead. Led by three professors from the University of Pennsylvania, the team was not made up of experts or specialists, but volunteers the professors had recruited. These members eventually even outperformed experienced intelligence analysts who had access to classified data. So what was the secret? Although they were a diverse range of individuals, they had some common traits. They are very widely read, curious about the world, and had extremely wide ranging interests. They are open to crossing disciplines and view their teammates as sources for learning. When their predictions were proven wrong, they view it as a chance to adjust their ideas and approaches. I trust you will Google about this team and how their composition actually enabled them to win. Now, I would like to think that these are the same kinds of traits that we are hoping to foster at NUS. The ability to combine insights from different groups, different disciplines, the flexibility to learn, unlearn, and relearn, and the openness to new ideas and diverse perspectives. That is also why conversions like this are important. They are a chance, conversations, sorry, like this are important. They are a chance for us to examine ideas, not just those of others, but also of our own, and to inform the larger dialogues that would help to bring Singapore into the future. I'm looking forward to the insights from today's event. We are certainly very privileged to hear from DPM Heng and his take on this subject, especially as he is one who is always and assiduously thinking in the best interests of Singapore and Singaporeans. Once again, thank you, DPM Heng. Thank you, Prof Tan. I now have the honour to invite Deputy Prime Minister Mr Heng Sui Kiet to deliver his speech. DPM, please. Mr Sia Fu Hua, Chairman NUS Board of Trustees, Professor Tan Eng Chai, President of NUS, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning. Let me start by congratulating NUS on your 115th anniversary. During this time, NUS has made remarkable progress. For both Singapore and NUS, one consistent feature has been our practice of thinking long-term and anticipating what lies ahead. So it is fitting that today's lecture is on the future of Singapore. 
This lecture takes place as we learn to live with COVID-19. Even before this pandemic, the world was becoming more complex and uncertain. COVID-19 has further disrupted our lives, put the global economy in a tailspin, and accelerated ongoing structural shifts. Post-COVID-19, we can expect greater disruptions and challenges, from rising sea levels, the next pandemic, greater US-China tensions, an aging population, and more. Singapore is in a better position than many countries to tackle the crisis and face the future. We experienced a few waves of COVID-19 infection, but we managed to contain the outbreaks each time. More than 70% of our population is fully vaccinated, one of the highest in the world, and we continue to maintain a good momentum on vaccination. Despite the anxieties and hardships, our people have remained united, standing in solidarity with one another. We are also in a much better position today than we were at independence in 1965. With no resources to tap on, using only their grit and ingenuity, our founding leaders put everyone in the same direction and did the impossible. They turned our disadvantages into strengths. This strengths put us in a good position today. Whether in 1965, the present, or in the future, one thing is certain. We will continue to face new challenges. Throughout history, societies around the world would have been faced with challenges, from internal strife to wars to famines and pandemics. Some societies came out of it better. Others disappeared or were absorbed. So challenges are inevitable for any society. The critical point is whether a society has an adaptive capacity to confront these challenges and in the process, develop new strengths. Contemplating the future of Singapore, I mouthed over how Singapore had built up our adaptive capacity and developed the strengths that we have today that gives us an edge. I also reflected on how we can build on them for a better future. Let me now touch on three of these strengths and how we can build new strengths. The first strength is our sense of unity, regardless of race, language, or religion. Singapore became a nation by accident. We do not have the ballast of common ancestry or centuries of tr shared traditions, language, and religion that many other societies have. But our founding leaders were determined to create a new nation that had an equal place for all races. This was why we parted ways with Malaysia. Through years of careful nurturing, today, we are not only one of the most diverse societies in the world, but also one of the most united. Our way of life, embracing diversity and living in harmony is not the natural order of things. Many societies, including those with long and proud histories, have seen tensions between races. Our multiracial harmony cannot be taken for granted. Recent racial incidents remind us of the undercurrents that still exist. While such occurrences are thankfully not the norm, they have provoked much public debate and reflection. It is heartening that Singaporeans care deeply about issues of race and religion. We are repulsed by these incidents. We clearly desire to do better as a society. How can we make progress? As with most social issues, there are many different perspectives and different views on this. We should be prepared to discuss this frankly, but sensitively. It is useful to appreciate that we not only have different opinions on these issues, but also different ways to approach them. The communal strife in the early years of nationhood left a deep impression on our early generations, myself included. We saw firsthand how issues of race and religion 
can easily agitate and divide a society, or worse still, get exploited by those with a political agenda. So we were determined to rally behind the bold vision of creating a multiracial, multi-religious society. Along the way, we acted on this vision with each community making sacrifices and accommodation. Things will not stay static. Every generation bears the responsibility of bringing us closer as one united people, regardless of race, language or religion. Our youths are proud of our sense of unity. You have a different lived experience and your generation will face new challenges that mine did not. While you have not experienced the chaotic years, many of you are better educated and more exposed to global events and trends. You have had opportunities to understand and discuss the difficult issues surrounding race and religion, not just locally, but globally. I know many among your generation tend to be more comfortable expressing your views on these issues, especially on social media. I hope that the sense of unity that we have built so far will stand you well. I'm confident that you will grow this further if you continue to approach these issues with humility and forbearance. The humility to recognize that each of us have our biases and blind spots. Being mindful of our biases and correcting them is a constructive step towards progress. Indeed, we should be firm in calling out transgressions when we see them, but also have the humility not to assume the worst of every action or comment. We should exercise forbearance when engaging with such issues, given the deep and emotive undercurrents. Progress cannot be made by advocating loudly for a single viewpoint. We should instead seek out the different perspectives and expand the space for convergence. This applies not just to our youth, but to all of us. Our sense of unity is a tremendous strength for Singapore. This unity is precious, but also fragile. And if every generation, including all of us here, embraces this strength and handles differences with humility and forbearance, I'm confident that Singapore can flourish in the coming decades. The second strength I would like to share is our creative capacity and our willingness to go against the tide. Creativity is not something that is often used to describe most Singaporeans, although we do have a vibrant creative sector. Singaporeans are generally better known for being hardworking, honest and resilient. But if not for the creativity of our early generations, we would not be where we are today. Our founding generation was creative in forging our own path and bucking conventional wisdom. We welcomed MNCs to invest here when critics saw MNCs as the new colonialists. These investments went on to propel our rapid growth. We developed a new airport in Changi against the advice of external consultants, which gave us an outsized presence on the world map. Our businesses too have been creative, venturing into the region when Asia's economy took off in the 1980s adding an external wing to our economy. Singaporeans also ventured abroad, taking on new responsibilities. Today, there are over 200,000 Singaporeans overseas. If there is one common thread running through this, it is our openness to the world. No matter how brilliant our plans were, we would not have succeeded if we had insulated ourselves. As a land-constrained nation with no natural resources, we had no other choice. Our openness to the world enabled us to ride the wave of globalization. Salaries improved, job opportunities grew, and Singapore became a vibrant city full of energy and ideas. In the coming years, the entry of millions of university graduates each year in Asia alone will add significantly to the global talent pool. 
the pace of technological change will further accelerate, quickening the pace of disruption. The reality is that it is not possible to bubble wrap our workers from foreign competition and still expect to succeed. The COVID experience of working from home has made remote work more commonplace now. But working from home is just one step away from working from anywhere. And if workers can work from anywhere, employers can easily seek out the best skilled workers from all parts of the world. In fact, some cities are starting to market themselves as a destination of choice for global remote workers. Even more physical jobs, such as port crane operators, can now be done remotely in the comfort of a control room. And the control room can possibly be located thousands of miles away. This means foreigners do not have to be in Singapore to compete with us. It will be increasingly difficult, if not impractical, to confine opportunities by geography. But embracing openness does not mean leaving our companies and people to fend for themselves. We are doing all that we can to transform our companies and equip our people to take on new opportunities. We have a head start on economic transformation, having embarked on our industry transformation maps since 2016. We are refreshing our ITMs, developing new strategies for a post-COVID world, and helping our companies digitalize and adapt. We are more closely integrating our economic transformation efforts with research and innovation. We are supporting our startups, and NUS has nurtured quite a few including PetSnap, Carousel, and Shopback. We are putting on even greater focus on jobs and skills, growing the Skills Future movement, and strengthening our tripartite effort on retraining and upskilling. There is certainly room to adjust our foreign manpower policies, and there is scope to strengthen our laws on fair treatment at the workplace. But Closing our doors is ineffective and provides a false promise of security. We must not box ourselves into a false choice. Instead, we should embrace both openness and equip our people with the experience and skills to succeed. This is how we will thrive in a rapidly evolving world. This way, our workers can remain confident about their position in the world and know that they can continue to make a difference, not just when they are fresh out of school, but throughout life. To all of you in the audience, your future is brimming with promise. Your education is preparing you well. Your multicultural upbringing gives you a great advantage in a diverse world. It gives you a better appreciation of our region and enables you to pursue new opportunities that Asia has to offer. I urge all of you to make the best of the opportunities out there and unleash your creative capacity. Think beyond just ourselves, but also how we can make a difference to the world. This is the best way for Singapore and Singaporeans to continue thriving in a more interconnected, interdependent, and technologically advanced world. The third strength I would like to share is our social compact. In Singapore, our founding leaders knew that for all Singaporeans to feel a sense of belonging and ownership, everyone must have a stake in our country. Education was a basic starting point. Our investment in education enabled our people to take on the better jobs that came with investments at better pay. Through our public housing scheme, most families, including lower income households, could own their homes. Their HDB flat became a vital asset. As we grew, we layered on additional safety nets and invested more in our people. We took a different path from more developed economies partly because we had very limited resources. 
we forged a social compact that is fair across generations while providing strong support for those who need it. We did not blindly copy the generous welfare systems in many developed economies created during the exuberance of the post-war economic boom, which soon became unaffordable. Countries that did piled on unsustainable debts. Unfunded pension liabilities are in the trillions of dollars. These societies now face hard choices of scaling back benefits or ballooning future tax burdens. Difficult choices, which often have a divisive effect on society. Unlike many developed countries, we inherited a social compact that has endured the test of time and that has united rather than divided our people. But how do we further strengthen our social compact at a time when societies around the world are facing intensified stresses and divides? Let me highlight a few areas and how we need to approach issues differently. One key area of focus is on our low-wage workers. We top up the incomes of the bottom 30% of our workers through workfare. But we did not stop there. Through the progressive wage model, we set and raise their basic wages and provide the, a ladder for them to take on larger roles. We are currently in the process of rolling out PWMs to many more sectors. But this is not something that governments alone can do. Everyone must play their part. Employers must help their workers upskill and create better working environments. Consumers must be prepared to pay a little more to uplift wages. Another well-known challenge is our aging population. We have increased healthcare capacity and subsidies. We also gave more to early generations through the Pioneer and Medica generation packages. But the key point is that the well-being of our seniors goes beyond this. It is also about whether our seniors remain actively engaged in the community and to reach out to those facing social isolation. This requires each of us to play a role in making Singapore a great place for our seniors to live in, as their children, their friends or their neighbours. This brings me to the next point. We must also do more to tackle the emerging challenge of mental well-being. Many of us face pressures from different fronts, at school, at work or at home, and having to deal with societal expectations. The pandemic has added further strain. As a society, we can better tackle mental well-being, raising awareness and destigmatizing the issues, and better support those who need help. Each of us can also do our part to show care and concern for those around us and create a safe space for those who need support to come forward. A stronger social compact requires a collective societal effort. I'm greatly encouraged that many of you in the audience and out there are doing your part, working with others to make a difference to the lives of others. We must continue to strengthen this. Increasingly, this will have to go beyond government measures and redistributive policies. Each of us will have a part to play and every effort counts. This is the only way we can strengthen our social compact and build a better future for everyone. I've outlined the three strengths that we have forged as a society. Looking at all of these strengths, one common thread is my deeply held belief that to build a better future, every Singaporean has a part to play by working in partnership, putting values into action, and making things happen. This conviction is shaped by my personal experiences in my first job as a policeman. As an undergraduate in the UK, I spent some time with the London Metropolitan Police during the summer holidays. It was soon after the Brixton riot, a series of violent clashes between the new immigrant community and the police. To visit the scenes of these riots, we had to take a special reinforced vehicle. 
To go on foot or by car was too dangerous, as there was a deep animosity in the people on the streets. The trust between the authority and people had broken down. Two years later, I was in Tokyo to study the Koban system, where police posts were placed close to communities. A police officer there was part of the community, supporting and mobilizing the community to maintain law and order. When the Singapore police force embarked on community policing in the 1980s, I embraced it fully and helped set up our neighborhood police posts. These two contrasting experiences taught me that laws cannot substitute for the heart and soul of a community. This goes beyond policing. If relationships can be built up over time, if people care for one another, they will look out for each other and we will have a more cohesive, more caring society. The opportunity to advance this deep conviction was one of the reasons I agreed to enter politics in 2011. I put this belief into action when leading our Singapore Conversations in 2012. Not only were Singaporeans heard, we were able to translate their inputs into policy changes, including MediShield Life and changes to the PSLE scoring system. Encouraged by these experiences, I launched the Singapore Together movement two years ago to go beyond inviting feedback and suggestions to encourage our people to put ideas into action. When COVID-19 struck, we saw an outpouring of support for those on the front line and for fellow Singaporeans who have fallen on hard times. If we are able to tap on this sense of care and concern to forge an even stronger partnership of action, I'm confident that we will build new strengths beyond the three that I've mentioned. Compared to 1965, our people are now better educated and better traveled. There's also a greater desire to contribute to nation building. Our central opportunity is to mobilize these diverse strengths in complementary ways to tackle the growing range of challenges we face. Through the Singapore Together movement, I hope that different groups will share more of their aspirations and resources and find creative ways to work together. Whether it is in, through volunteering your time or initiating something new, forging effective partnerships enable us to achieve more. I'm also glad to see our newest form of partnership, the Alliances for Action, taking off. This is a nimbler way to collaborate with a strong bias towards action. Let us continue to grow new strengths, especially among our young. Let me conclude. As we look towards a much more uncertain and complex global future, we can build upon the three key strengths in our society. Our sense of unity in a multiracial, multireligious, multicultural society. Our creative capacity in forging our own path in our national development and our social compact that allowed us to give every citizen a stake in the country. But there is nothing intrinsically enduring about these strengths. Our founding generation built these strengths from nothing through their wits and will. As quickly as these strengths have blossomed, they can also wither if we do not adapt. To have a better future, we must build on these strengths and be prepared to grow new ones. Our ability to adapt depends on whether we can harvest lessons from our past, tend to the present, and seed the future. If we do, Singapore can continue to flourish for generations to come, much like the beautiful trees that can be found throughout your campuses. This will require hard work and constant commitment the strengths that I've described emanate from every one of us. To cultivate our sense of unity, we must embrace harmony in diversity. To grow our creative capacity, we must repay, remain open to the world. To reinforce our social compact, we must each be prepared to play a part. Each of us 
must continue to deepen our own values, grow our adaptive capacity, and build meaningful relationships with the people around us. Above all, we must commit to growing new strengths. NUS has come a long way since your founding. From a modest medical school with 23 students, you are now a world-renowned university with almost 40,000 students. You have developed generations of youths, provided them with a first-class education, and inculcating in them the right values that will grow our strengths. You have also worked in close partnership with companies, government, and other institutions in Singapore and abroad to make new discoveries and breakthroughs. You are well positioned to tackle the major challenges ahead and contribute to shaping our future. The future is exciting and bright for NUS and for Singapore. Congratulations once again on your 150th anniversary. Let me also take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy National Day. Thank you. Thank you, DPM. May we invite you and Associate Prof. Zaina to take your seats on stage for the question and answer session. Thank you, uh, DPM, for you. sharing with us uh, your invaluable insights. Um, I must admit that I was uh, quite struck by your call uh, for us to remember the strengths that we have built as a nation and to realise, as you say so succinctly, that there's really nothing intrinsically enduring about these strengths. And we, sh we need to remember that. Uh, we have actually quite a number of questions coming through. Uh, and, and I would encourage everyone to uh, still continue to register your questions. Uh, but if you can indulge me, I thought I would kick off our Q&A sure. uh, with uh, my question uh, before <laughs> I, I take the questions from the audience. In your speech, you identified three key strengths that we need to harness uh, for our future. Uh, they are all equally important, but you began your speech uh, talking about this uh, sense of unity that we have living in harmony with our diversity. Uh, this is a point, obviously, that touches me very deeply mm. as a Singaporean, and I wanted to raise this question at the start. Uh, I was struck by your question that, you know, we, by your point, you know, that we all care about multiracial, multiracialism, our multi-religiosity. Uh, we've grown up with this. But the reality is that we may all have very di different approaches to it, to this question. Uh, you flagged how Singaporeans who may have who have experienced the precarious nature of living with diversity made key sacrifices to maintain harmony. But we are, we are faced with a younger generation of Singaporeans. Uh, my children's generation, the students that I teach at the university, they have a very different understanding of what inclusivity means. Um, diversity for them, all kinds of diversity, should be celebrated, often loudly. Uh, are you confident that we can find space for these different appro approaches to converge? You mentioned this in your speech. How do we balance being inclusive for all with the idea that we need to have give and take as Singaporeans? Um, there's actually another question related to this. Uh, do you want me to raise this question specifically? Is it related? It Thank is you. actually related. So let me go to that. Um, let me press here. So this question is about asking how we can do better as a society to include and interact with individuals who come from cultures and practices very different from our own. Uh, so it's this idea of inclusivity and how we can be as inclusive as possible. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Susanna. I think those are very, uh, very good questions. So first, let me say that my, my starting point is that uh, diversity is to be uh, celebrated. It is but you know, you, it's interesting that you said that uh, there were some who felt that you know, we should celebrate it loudly. I, I don't think um, pushing differences loudly, that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm very different from you and so on, is, is the way to celebrate diversity. Mm -hmm. I think the key question that we have to ask ourselves is, 
Does that diversity add something to others and to our society and to the world? Now, one very interesting thing that you, you learn from nature is that you know, nature is full of diverse colours and, and diverse uh, flora and fauna. And it, it exists in a certain uh, state of uh, a balance, which really adds a lot of colour. Otherwise, the world would be a black and white uh, world. And in that regard, I think there are various aspects of how diversity can be harnessed as a strength that we should focus and which are the areas of diversity that we should respect and draw boundaries on the way we approach. So let me start with something which was started by uh, President Tai Chai's uh, statement, uh, story about the efforts that go into R&D in the NUS, the efforts that, went in, that go into uh, the story about this uh, forecasting. And what is interesting in all that story, uh, all the three uh, points that uh, Prof Tan shared, is that in, if you take, for example, in the academic area, the academics share a common purpose of, can I understand the world a little better? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a specific subject like economics or, or in a subject where this interdisciplinary approach essentially means that I'm tackling the same set of complex reality, but from different perspective. Mm -hmm. And in that way, that dialogue, that shared purpose of trying to understand the world better, trying to make the world better, allows us to really harness different viewpoints. And if you look at organizations that are creative, that are innovative, it's the same thing, that uh, there is no one approach that must work for all times but rather by combining the different points of view, by looking at the issues from different perspectives, we come to a richer understanding of the world. And, we, and not only that, uh, but hopefully in that process, we build a better understanding among ourselves so that we can act on those insights, we can act on those findings. So that type of uh, diversity where you share a very common purpose mm. uh, it's actually is very valuable. And it really doesn't matter whether you are a researcher, whether you are young or old, whether you are male or female, what race you are, because you share, that's what you share in common. Now, the second uh, uh, area is where the values come into play. Uh, the two researchers on, say, AI, for instance, may have completely different views about the ethics of AI. Mm -hmm. Because if the AI can make decisions on you, what is the decision criteria? The decision criteria is not a technical problem anymore. It is an issue of values. And in that context, that's where I think that discussion must take place. And we must respect that if we have different values, then how do we uh, come to some agreement? If we have to take a common course of action, how do we have a discussion on what values matter? You know, should I be saving? this uh, uh, group of people versus that group of people if AI is applied in a certain way you know, when it comes to a certain set of incidents. So what is a decision-making matrix which is inherently values-laden? And in that regard, I think a robust discussion on what are the values that should go into the programming of that AI machine is going to be quite critical. Now, there's a third type for which Really, individuals should be free to make their own choices. It really doesn't matter. We are not having to take a common course of action except occasionally. A uh, good example, actually, is, for example, in, in my family, my children and I, just uh, when you were relating, right, we have very different tastes in music. Mm. I think they share much more in common with young people all around the world with, with certain kinds of pop music and, and hard rock. Uh, I, uh, come from a different generation. Uh, I enjoy classical music a lot more. So each of us have their own, our own space uh, to listen to uh, the music that we like. We try and find as much as common uh, as a family as possible when it comes to you know, the occasional movies that we watch or the, or the food. Even in terms of food, taste in food, my family has very different tastes. And uh, so when it comes to... Uh, uh, daily meal is not so much an issue because a daily meal is a simple one. But when we go, we have to decide which restaurants to go to. This is where we say, well, you know, who whose choice uh, predominates? 
and invariably, you know, we, we take turns. And, and even if I go to a restaurant that I don't normally enjoy as much, I say, well, it's, an, it's a new experience. It, there's nothing wrong. And that's how I keep the family together, mm. you know, that we have a lot more common space. So I think there are certain choices that we don't have to uh, dictate and say that, well, you know, everyone must have this kind of music, this kind of food, and this kind of... Mm. So those diversity are choices which we should let individuals make. And that brings me to my point about when we talk about um, the uh, you know, race, language, uh, religion, and how can we include cultural practices. Now, this is an area for which I think it's very important for us to, uh, to have a very open mind and to accept that religion, for example, is not something which we can uh, force somebody to embrace. It is, we must allow for different people with different religious beliefs to practice what they believe in. You know, because they may have personal experiences of particular episodes, they may have uh, a certain uh, exposure and upbringing and personal experiences for which we must respect. And we must try and find what is in common with among the religions and try and uh, and uh, ensure that we respect that and don't go around with a view that only my religion, my religious belief is correct. And, you know, and when it comes to issues of race, to go beyond uh, you know, racial ste stereotypes, but I think I mean, we as humans have a lot more in common with each other than just the colour of our skin. So it is important for us to embrace that. I mean, when I... Uh, the, uh, uh, in my interactions with uh, different groups you know, throughout my career. I started in the police, and the police force is one of the most racially diverse mm -hmm. organisations. Uh, we had really uh, great fun uh, working together. But when it came to, for example, dealing with specific sensitive incidents, I know that certain officers uh, with that deeper cultural understanding mm -hmm. and uh, are able to deal with it better, and I send those officers to deal with it. And so till today, many of these uh, officers are still in touch with me. So I think it is very important for us to partner that diversity, but at the same time respect that uh, boundary. So how do we, uh, the question of how do we include uh, you know, stronger cultural practices, I, I would say that if we can deepen understanding in our uh, schools, in our universities at the beginning, you know, when people are still in the education system, I think that will be very good. Yes, just now I heard from uh, Prof Tan that you have started this uh, community engagement efforts and getting students to do projects. I think it's, it's a brilliant uh, a move. So as part of that process, looking at what is it that university students uh, can do in order to deepen their understanding uh, will be very, very helpful. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, DPM. Uh, let's shift the questions a little bit to a second point that you raised in your speech, mm. which is on the creative capacity. Yeah. And, and there's a question here uh, with regards, uh, tied to education, right? Uh, you mentioned in your speech that uh, the reality is that we can't bubble wrap. Uh, yes. You know, we, uh, the reality for us is that we, we have to be global. We have to embrace openness, right? Uh, so we do have a question here about the nature of working from everywhere that you mentioned. It's a question... Um, uh, from a student, sounds like it. Uh, so, the question is, the point about working from anywhere is an important one. Uh, I guess we will need to prepare our students for this. So, the question is, what and how would you recommend that we do so? Right? Uh, it's, it's really preparing ourselves to be truly global. Mm. It's really preparing ourselves to take charge of this interconnectedness Right. Uh, what technology is providing us. So what more can we do and what more should we do yes. in preparing our students for this? Well, that, that's again, it's a, it's a very good question. And I would say that you know, we should, um, in a way, prepare the, uh, the mindsets and orientation of our students. My, my personal belief is that, uh, first, do, do we believe that we want to work with people of, from around the world? And I, I, I do think that you know, we, we should. 
Um, I should share a personal story that uh, uh, several years back, I, well, when, when I was very, very young, there was a very famous, very good TV series on TV called Cosmos by uh, the astronomer mm. Carl Sagan. And I recently saw another video of him I, that he, uh, when he was advising uh, NASA on the uh, space voyage, he got the uh, spacecraft to turn around when he was thousands of miles away to take a picture of planet Earth uh, from that distance. And from, the plan from that great distance, all you see is a blue planet. And then he called it that the Earth is actually a pale blue dot. It's just a pale blue dot in this huge uh, universe. But yet, in this pale blue dot, it is teeming with life teeming with uh, a diversity of life, a diversity of flora, fauna, and, and human lives. So we really have a lot in, in common, and he is a strong advocate of how you know, we must try and safeguard this planet and all the life on Earth. And in that regard, I think it's important for us that, you know, there, that we do our part to uh, contribute to this effort. But in order to do that, I'll say that the qualities that our people need will be first the confidence. Confidence in ourselves, in what we can do, and building that skills. You mentioned about technology. And how can we equip ourselves as best as we can to learn the technology to be able to exercise our you know, creativity, imagination, and our ability uh, to do some good. But at the same time, uh, that confidence has to be coupled with a certain humility. I, I have been working uh, in many international uh, forums with many different people, and it, there are lots and lots of uh, you know, very insightful people all around the world. And it is very important for us to have the humility to work with people from around the world, but not feeling diffident about ourselves. Mm. You know, how do you have to combine that confidence with that humility to learn uh, to be able to work with others. And in particular, uh, coming from Singapore, it's very important for us not to think that the Singapore model is the model because there are many, every society has different uh, history, culture, heritage, and uh, circumstances that they are facing today are different. So there will be many different ways of doing things and we must not assume that you know, our way is the best way. But having the humility to say, well, what is it that we can learn? What is it that may be uh, applicable and for which we will be happy to share and work together with, with them? And finding like-minded souls in these places for us to work together. And a third is really about openness. Being open to considering that there may be uh, interesting options. Uh, many years ago, when uh, my wife and I were traveling in Indonesia, uh, we were on a base, big uh, intercity bus, and on the bus was a German engineer. Mm. So we ended up, it was such a long journey, we ended up chatting. And I said, uh, I asked him, why are you... Uh, he, he, I saw that he was like counting, looking very intensely at all the public buses and how it stopped. I said, oh, I noticed that uh, we were looking at the scenery, you were, you were looking at uh, the buses. What are you doing? He said, oh, uh, I'm actually a railway engineer in uh, Germany, but I find that the bus system here is so fascinating. I say, what's so fascinating about it? I say, well, you know, uh, there, there is no timetable, there is no register, but yet it seems to operate so efficiently. Yeah. And what is it that, uh, what makes it work? So. I was very struck because here was a German engineer used to a, a very systematic way of doing things, used to using all the tools. And then he said, it's such an efficient system, you know, it's remarkable. He said, well, you know, in Germany, sometimes we have all these buses running at specific times, and then it runs empty because it just rigidly follows the schedule. <laughs> so I was very int uh, intrigued to learn that recently there are some groups that are looking at, can you have an app that would aggregate demand? and for which people say, okay, I, I would like to be at this point at this time, and the bus operates in a particular you know, schedule, and that combination of the app and the AI system allows the bus routing to be a lot more flexible than the fixed route. So I, 
I was very struck by the humility and openness of this uh, German engineer to say, let me see what I can learn from the system that is so different from mine. So I'll say it's very important as Singaporeans venture out uh, to the region, A, to have this mindset that you know, we'll be happy, that we'll see what we can contribute uh, to causes uh, in, in the region. And second, what is it that you know, I'm bringing to the, uh, to the discussion and what is it that I can learn uh, from this discussion? And in that process, I think we can do a lot better. You know, we can play our part and it's a meaningful uh, endeavour. I wanted to go, I mean, understandably, we're getting quite a lot of questions with regards to education. Uh -huh. uh, so let me go to this particular question, which is uh, related here. Um, and that is about the generalist and the specialist. Uh, and so the question here is really about uh, our move towards interdisciplinary education. In, in uh, what you just said, right? For example, the engineer who was, who was learning from others, right? Mm. Uh, so the question is, uh, is really asking about uh, in the future, right? Are specialists, the engineer uh, and so on, are they really that relevant to our workforce? Uh, is this movement towards interdisciplinary education essentially moving specialists entirely out of what we anticipate the workforce to be in the future? Well, it's a very good question, and I am not sure I have one definitive answer to that. My sense is that it really depends on the fields that you are uh, working in. Mm. In some fields, you do really want to be a deep specialist. Mm. If I think of, uh, say, you know, a surgeon who is going to operate on us, I would rather that he is a great specialist in that particular field because it needs that number of years of experience and training to be really good in that particular area. If I need someone to do the, the programming of a computer, of a, he needs to be more than that. But uh, what other knowledge will be important to that surgeon, to that uh, computer scientist? Uh, well, it's something which we must discuss. I mentioned about, you, know, you may be great at AI, but what is the ethics of AI? Should the course on teaching students about AI also have an important dimension on ethics? I say yes. You know, similarly with a surgeon, you, know, you are still bound by the Hippocratic Oath and so on. And what else do we need to learn? And even in the medical field, there's now a lot of evidence that uh, the, the human body is a lot more interconnected than we thought. And so if you are doing research on health in general, uh, it has to go beyond that. I was looking at some literature on uh, the dementia, and it is not just the, the brain, but also how your social activities affect the uh, onset of dementia and so on. So that sort of interdisciplinary work will be valuable. So it really depends on the context. But I am not against having deep specialists. Uh, but uh, and in certain fields, uh, right now the most commonly used you know, is about T, right? the T-shaped. So you have a deep specialist and then you also have broad general knowledge. There are now people who say, no, it should be pi. You, know, you should have two verticals and uh, some knowledge at the top and some knowledge at the bottom, and others who say, no, it's a different T. I, I think all these different ideas come from the fact that you do, depending on the context, you do need different uh, sets of skills. Mm -hmm. And rather than make a broad generalization, I'll say that let's look at what is it that you expect the person to do to be able to do. Okay, uh, we also have uh, questions related to uh, you know, what we are going through now centred around COVID. Mm. Uh, so let me uh, move in this direction. Uh, and uh, this one, I think, is a question we hear often. Uh, but nonetheless, I thought it's a great question uh -huh. uh, and I should raise it at this point. So the question is, dear DPM, I greatly miss travelling overseas for my holidays. Uh, in your personal opinion, when can we eventually begin to travel freely again? Well, on, on this question, uh, my first response is going to be, uh, so do all of us. But, but uh, interestingly, the Tourism Board did uh, uh, yeah, had this Singapore Rediscover voucher to try and support our uh, local, local tourism industry. And I have met a number of friends who said, 
you know, Mr. Hing, I've always been traveling each time there's a vacation, but this time I cannot travel. And I have, I'm amazed at the different sights and sounds of Singapore. You know, I didn't realize that Singapore is, has changed so much. Mm. So I would say that the first thing we should do is try and rediscover Singapore. And I, I'm trying to do some of this. And I, I say my own personal experience has been that, you know, I too was one of those who say, oh, let's go and travel overseas. But I have learned a lot. And uh, there are lots of interesting things to do, um, you know, even within Singapore. But uh, that said, the, when can we travel? It's not just the situation in Singapore, it's also the situation elsewhere. But I think a key uh, thing will be when vaccinations in Singapore reaches a certain level, uh, we can uh, open up uh, the uh, economy, open up our travel a little more. But for some of this travel, we have unilateral opening, but for some, you do need reciprocal. The other party must be willing to accept you. And, uh, and there are different rules today on how long you have to be quarantined and so on, or what kind of tests. But I'm, I'm quite hopeful that a lot of work is going on on uh, pre-testing and so on. And if we can do that, uh, we can learn to live with the virus and look at how we can travel and how we can continue to carry on life. Hopefully, we can make COVID more like an uh, influencer. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a related question, uh, but slight, maybe on a slightly more serious note, which is centred around uh, your own sense of how serious uh, the current situation is within the region mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the Delta variant, uh, in terms of our efforts to open up. Uh, would this uh, you know, uh, dampen it significantly? Uh, can we do more in terms of working with the region to try and uh, you know, uh, move beyond the current situation? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, in indeed, I think the Delta variant is uh, highly transmissible and it is a new you know, spanner in the works and we have to deal with it. And it has, the infection numbers have actually spiked up very significantly in mm -hmm. our region. So the, our foreign minister is working together with his counterparts to see what we can do together in some areas. But at the same time, I think it is very important for every country to take all the necessary measures. It's not going to be... Uh, any kind of lockdown is terribly stressful and it's not at all popular. But I think and it has a huge impact on the economy. But it is important for us to put as the first priority of saving lives and uh, reducing the, uh, the spread of the virus. The faster the virus spreads, the more mutations we are likely to see. Uh, we have a question here with regards to, again, some, uh, you, know, you mentioned in your speech about uh, the reality is that what we are going through, we will clear, but this is not the end of it, right? Uh, that, that in fact, we are preparing for the next stage, uh, possibly yet another pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the question is really about uh, how, do, how do you anticipate students and future employees in the local workforce prepare for this possibility? Uh, what are some of the sort of things that probably need to be uh, introduced uh, and considered? Well, uh, first, I'll say that for, for pandemics, you know, it is going to be a global uh, issue and it's important for us to work together with uh, global organisations like WHO and uh, strengthen our R&D efforts mm -hmm. with uh, key players around the region uh, and around the world, rather, to uh, look at what is it that we need to do. And nationally, we need to consider what else we need to do to prepare for this. The, we had the experience of SARS, and uh, we set up the NCID. And the NCID has been doing very good work. You have teams of people looking at that. And our early investments in, in our R&D, in the human genome and our biomedical sciences, has allowed us to uh, produce test kits to uh, come up with some important contributions. So those are efforts that we must continue to invest. And in fact, as part of my effort as chairman of National Research Foundation, I'm, I'm looking at what are the R&D work that we will need to do, and uh, for which our universities and our medical schools will have to play a very important role, you know, together with NCID, to see what else we need to do to prepare for that. Mm. 
So both nationally as well as uh, globally. But for a student, for a workforce, what is it that we can do? I would say that uh, it's a very good question. And I, I think if we look at companies which were able to continue to uh, uh, open and operate, uh, they had put in uh, measures to deal with it. So we must assume that if something like this happened again, what are the measures that would allow us to resume activities? Uh, working from home, for example, was initially very, very hard for many people. But it has now become a norm, and there are many young people who tell me, oh, you know, it's, it's so nice to not to have to travel and spend you know, two hours a day having to go to uh, home to office, and that is quite productive. So I think there will be changes like this that we can make to make the workplace more resilient. I was talking to some uh, people who were in the business of office space, and they said, oh, demand for office space has come down because people are working from home. But on the other hand, there are people who say, well, maybe we should redesign our houses in, in a way that gives a bit more space for families to have to you know, stay at home to work together. Yeah. And what is it that we can do? So I think those are things that we will need to prepare for. Okay. Uh, we, we don't have much time, uh, uh, too much time anymore, but I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit to uh, the point you raised with regards to the social compact. Mm -mm. Uh, and in there, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, these are some of the challenges that we would have to think about uh, and we would have to address as part of this, uh, you know, uh, us working on a new social compact and strengthening what we have, right? Mm -hmm. And one, of, uh, one area that you mentioned was clearly demographics and uh, ageing, mm. means our ageing uh, aging population. We have a question with regards to employability uh, um, uh, for those who, for the seniors uh, among us, right? Uh, so, what are some of the the, the things you think uh, should be, you know, expanded on or introduced to ensure that we keep our seniors employed uh, and employed respectively, uh, respectfully uh, in Singapore? Well, it's a it's a great question. So, uh, I think we have to tackle it at various levels. First, at the national level our policies and the legislation regarding retirement uh, ages. So we are raising the retirement and re-employment mm -hmm. ages. Uh, second, I think we need to look at what are the other ways in which we can uh, continue to make the best use of the experiences and the, uh, the skills of our seniors. And there, I don't think there can be a one-size-fits-all and say, well, you know, everybody going to AT will be the, the, the solution, but how best we, we can uh, make the best use of the ability of uh, different people. I recently met uh, Professor Wang Keng Wu, mm. and Professor Wang Keng Wu is past 90. So I was chatting with him, and I said, I, uh, I said Oh, I am now working from home, and I'm still active. I mean, he has just published his latest book. So, you know, someone like him is just continuing to be extremely active, but he contributes in his own ways in, in a particular area. So I would say that for academics, you have a much greater opportunity to continue your work, uh, even if you are not in the leadership position, but just your area of passion would allow you. But for the vast majority of our, of our people in that age group, um, it is an age group where, unfortunately, uh, pre-independence, our uh, educational level was not so uh, high. In fact, uh, in my uh, primary school, uh, more than half of my uh, cohort actually failed PSLE. And uh, so in terms of their life experiences and work experiences, it has also been a bit more limited. Mm -hmm. But we must do our best to look at how we can create a whole variety of different jobs from different age groups with different uh, background skills and abilities for them to uh, continue. And if we can create those uh, uh, jobs that are near the homes, you'll be very, very useful. Mm. Because they may not want to do a full-time work, but just doing you know, a quarter-time, half-time may be very good. Right. So maybe it's a project that the uh, uh, president can consider when you do your community uh, engagement effort. What is it that for seniors, uh, what, is, what can they do? I should give one a very good example. When uh, Minister Gan Kim Yong and I uh, started this community network of seniors, 
we started as a pilot and we thought it should be scaled up. So now we have a community now for seniors uh, throughout Singapore. And that came about because we at first had a Pioneer Generation ambassador, so they go around visiting seniors. And then when we had the Medica Generation, we renamed it to Civil Generation ambassador. So they go around uh, interacting with seniors in the neighborhood. So they are residents of the neighborhood. They go around interacting with seniors in the neighborhood. Original plan was just for them to explain what the Pioneer Generation package was about, but it turned out to be far more valuable than that. They became a, a great befriender, mm. uh, especially to seniors who were living alone. So I think if we can build on that and create a very different environment, I think that will be uh, valuable. So we must think of new interesting ways in which we can keep our seniors meaningfully engaged. Mm. Thank you, DPM. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I thought I would end off with this one question because uh, we are here to celebrate uh, NUS. Uh, and there is a question about uh, NUS here. So the question is uh, really to ask you about your thoughts with regards to how NUS and other Singapore universities need to further transform to be very central in shaping Singapore's future. Well, uh, that, that's a great question. and I. In fact, uh, I will start by saying that it will be a great topic for uh, uh, chairman and uh, president to uh, have a good discussion with all your uh, faculty members and staff as well as uh, the students on how, what is NUS's role in doing this. And I share, said it because when I uh, did the Singapore conversation, I found it to be extremely meaningful and the, then later on, you know, I started the Singapore Together. And the Singapore Together came about actually uh, from my interaction with a group of students. It was a group of students whom I addressed during the uh, pre-U seminar. They were A-level students. And I said, well, what are, you, what are you young people concerned with? And to my great surprise, every one of them said inequality. I said, why? They said, well, you know, we can see that the primary one student coming to P1 some can read very well, some can't. Mm. And uh, they are disadvantaged at the starting point. So I looked at them and I said, what can you do about it? And they were quite stunned by my question because they're asking me, what can I do? And I, instead, I turned the question and said, what can you do? And they said, so we, we discussed, we spent five minutes you know, looking at different options. And in the end, uh, together we came up with this idea that suppose the P2 boy or the P3, uh, P2 student or the P3 mm. student who would have one or two years of uh, primary school, can come 10 minutes a day earlier with the P1 student and read together. Would it make a difference? Mm. Because in a school year of 40 weeks, there will be uh, 400 minutes. And they all say, oh yes, that will be uh, valuable. So I think uh, there are a lot of things that we can do. Now going back, coming back to NUS then, about how we can tie this you know, to my idea for Singapore together. I, I think it's important for the faculty to, uh, and the students to discuss what can be done and with, the, with Zoom, with uh, chat groups and so on, and with your alumni, mm. uh, lots of things can be said. But I will personally uh, mention a couple of areas. Uh, one is, since I'm chairman of National Research Foundation, I would like to see NUS doing uh, a, even more in our R&D efforts. And I'm quite confident that all the efforts that you have put in will be important because I believe that technology and innovation will be uh, key to Singapore's future, will be key uh, to the global mm -hmm. community's future. And how can we do that? How can we build links with some of the best people from around the world, some of the best companies, and also put a focus on how we can get people, get companies to make use of it. One of the gaps in R&D has always been that I'm a researcher, I know a lot about that subject, but is it useful mm. to uh, the world? Is it useful to the community? Uh, I wouldn't know because you know, I, I know a lot about my physics and chemistry and whatever, or my engineering that I'm doing, but what are the needs in the world and how we can find that uh, linkage and strengthen that linkage should be very valuable to translate findings into that. And in that process, I think many of our younger stu young students can uh, deal with that, and they can be very, you know, when they are work 
interning at these institutions and are working, they can be great uh, bridges for this effort. Yeah. The other is uh, the, what uh, President mentioned about the community engagement effort. I think it is, uh, I, I would highly commend that because it is important for uh, NUS student, for Singapore University students to understand our community and what is it that we can do. Um, I, you know, I've been a public officer for 40 over, uh, 30 over years before I entered politics. And entering politics, you find that when I interacted with my uh, residents much more uh, deeply, it's a completely different experience. Mm. Because while you're doing policy, you're doing it at a macro level. When you are interacting with a resident, you're doing it at a micro level, at a person-to-person -person level. And things will need to uh, be uh, provided or you know, help will need to be given, support will need to be given in a much more targeted way. And that has been valuable. So I think the students doing that will learn a great deal. And they learn a great deal about teamwork and how we can do it together. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third element which I, I, would, I hope NUS can do is really to uh, build uh, linkages and build understanding with people around the world, but certainly in the region. So I'm, I'm very uh, happy that, for example, you have a very diverse uh, community of faculty members and uh, students mm -hmm. in NUS. Uh, I hope that our students and our faculty members take the best opportunity to learn from one another. And if you can structure projects in a way that uh, allows the one who is different to uh, contribute, I think it will uh, show the value. I remember speaking to uh, someone in university one day and he was talking about a project. In fact, there were two groups of people I spoke to. One is actually in NUS. I was walking around, they were showcasing the innovation. And this was an IT, uh, an, an app, which this group of students came together to uh, uh, develop. So the group comprises two students from, uh, I think, two students from India and two students from Singapore. Two students were in the business B school, the two were in the IT mm. area. And I said, oh, this is very, very good. How did you all come together? And the Indian students said, actually, we don't know business. The two Singaporean students were great. They understood business needs. The two business students told me, we don't know how to code. So it's great that... Uh, so I said, good. I mean, that's the kind of teamwork we should, uh, uh, we should pro uh, try and build. And uh, in another uh, lecturer whom I spoke to, he said, well, he had a, a foreign student and they all had to do a project. So he decided that these foreign students came from a particular country. So the project was, if you have to grow your business in this country, what would you do? So all the Singapore students look at this the foreign student and say, hey, tell us what is the, how to do business in your country. So I think uh, structuring projects, structuring interactions that allow our Singapore students to interact with people, to develop a better understanding, to see the value of working with others uh, will be very valuable. And I think we need to pay a lot of attention to that social interaction mm. to be able to bring out the best in everyone and mm. to really make this education even more rounded. Thank you, uh, DPM. Uh, there are two words that struck me listening to you this morning uh, that, that's still very fresh in my mind, and, uh, and that is humility and understanding. Yeah. I think you've, you've emphasized it uh, this morning, and it's actually, in fact, very, very important. Yes. We haven't been able to take all the questions, so I apologize to the audience, but thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts and being so open with us uh, this morning. Yes, thank, thank you. you. DPM. Thank you. And all the best to NUS. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, DPM and Associate Prof. Susanna. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's session. We hope you have enjoyed the discussion. A video recording of today's session will be made available on the NUS 115 website over the next few days. Thank you once again for joining us. Stay safe and have a pleasant day ahead.